Hello, we're here in Dortmund. It's Lucy speaking from the comms department and um, we're talking People of Play On with the brilliant team from Calibri Theatre and we're going to be speaking to them today about their project Watergate. So um, if you'd like to introduce yourselves, that would be brilliant. Um, Vido, perhaps you'd like to go first. Myself. Uh, so my name is Vido. Actually, this is my nickname, uh, Yuri Vidovsky, and I am uh, um, a theatre director from Colibri Theatre Budapest. And I'm Patrizia Fajor, and uh, I worked with Vido as a visual designer for the project. Fantastic. So um, we heard a little bit about Watergate uh, yesterday when everyone did their um, production presentations um, and it looked like a really exciting combination of theatre and escape room and kind of gameplay. And I wondered if you could perhaps, Vito, talk about your process from the sort of initial idea, perhaps following the meeting um, in Budapest that we had for the project, right through to the kind of performance of it and when audiences came in, um, kind of what your thought process was as you as you went from A to B, if that makes sense. So our meeting in Budapest um, nearly nearly two years ago, one and a half years ago, uh, it was a year ago, it was uh, about, uh, that was a play on meeting, which is an international collaboration. And uh, the play on uh, collaborations goal is to find uh, immersive technologies and new way of storytelling in theater. So basically that was our starting point. And um, when we were thinking, uh, how can we find an alternative storytelling? Uh, how can we include game elements, probably video game elements or other game mechanics in, in, uh, in a theater piece? which changes basically the storytelling, the way of storytelling. Uh, plus, how can we use something uh, immersive, which means how can we include the audience participation in the storytelling? Then uh, uh, we were pretty much blocked for a good while. So what can we do? And uh, a bit later, um, I started to work um, uh, with a game designer. Uh, he's a video game designer, Chaba, and a playwright. And they both were trying to obviously imagine somehow what can we do. And they both were trying to drag the project into their directions. And basically my, so that means the writer was writing dialogues and the storyline and beautiful monologues, et cetera, et cetera. And the game designer was just uh, seeing the, the whole project as basically it, it were a video game somewhere. And uh, somehow I was trying to put these two concepts together and, um, and to, to combine it. And then Patricia came into the picture. And uh, uh, so the idea was to, to create two rooms, which are basically like two escape rooms, and bring the audience member there where they will uh, have just like in an escape room, the activity which they discover something in those rooms. So was that a totally new process for you in the sense of bringing together this specific design element, the the writer kind of bring? Was that kind of combination a whole new process that that you went through to to get to that point? Yeah, absolutely. So I I didn't know where to go. Uh, I only knew that I can't. So I don't want to make a conventional theatre piece. So that's why I was trying to kind of give a hard time to the to the playwright to forget about the writing a proper scene or whatever. And um, and I, I did know that somehow, and I'm not so familiar with video games and game game mechanics. So actually that was a, that was a harder bit for me because uh, I couldn't really imagine how they could work uh, in, in uh, with, I mean, in a live action. Uh, we talked actually to Rachel Briscoe as well from the UK who had a great experience in uh, creating uh, live games with uh, interactive games with, with, uh, with participants and uh, in which there are no actors at all. So, uh, so all these elements kind of were leading me somewhere, somehow to, to certain decisions, you know, and this is how we got to the point. Brilliant. And so, Patricia, could you talk a little bit about your process and um, perhaps some of the challenges you faced, but also the kind of opportunity that this type of project lended to your expertise in particular? Yeah, of course. So uh, the concept was a bit challenging in itself, too, because uh, I am a lover of sci-fi. 
and uh, I have a good knowledge about uh, liter literature, movies, series in sci-fi, but so do the young people that we are uh, showing these rooms to. And uh, it's quite hard to uh, imagine yourself in a world 100 years later, what materials would they use, uh, what, uh, what elements do they include that uh, we have no idea what they are. And uh, it's quite hard to create these things and uh, make them not uh, look like bootleg or cringy for the young people who have seen everything <laughs> in games and movies. Also, uh, we had to include technology. We had to hide uh, the cables, the cameras, everything in the rooms. And not like in theater, the people came in, touched everything. So everything had to be real from up close as well. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Well, it sounds like a serious challenge actually. And um, um, I know that um, we were speaking earlier and both of you were talking about how the audiences all reacted differently, but there were some sort of wild things that they got up to in the, in the experience. Maybe you could talk a little bit about between, uh, a little bit between you about some of those experiences with the audience in this new kind of um, formats, like how they interacted with the story and, and things that surprised you, or um, for instance, with the audience. Oh yeah, one of my favorites was uh, we have a key hidden in ice in a freezer in the rooms and we have an electric device which generates heat. It is a very retro device uh, which you can uh, use these uh, transparent papers and uh, it lights them up on the wall. Overhead projectors. Oh yeah, overhead projectors. <laughs> they managed to turn them on, they managed to use them, but uh, one group had the idea to melt the ice on them. Wow, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> was that a, did you, did, at that point in the project, like, does someone rush in and stop them or what happens? Uh, no, in that case, I think that someone uh, yeah. in the room uh, the, uh, kind of realized that it's probably not the best idea to do. So, it's, you know, like, unless they want to execute themselves, you know. <laughs> but, uh, you know, this is something you wouldn't even think that somebody's idea would be that to, to you know. So, yeah, absolutely. My what my my experience was basically that um, when when the when the audience but participants let's say uh, are left alone in the room and uh, they 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 got the first message through through video that they should discover certain hints in the room uh, then uh, in the first ten fifteen minutes uh, of the first fifteen minutes it's completely chaotic because uh, the, this. 12 up to 15 people are running everywhere in the room and they touch everything and they open everything and they take down everything etc etc but they don't communicate really with each other for the first time and the uh, first period of the of that uh, of that uh, of the game and that's why they can't realize the connections between the uh, objects or the items they find um, and at the beginning, it was quite worrying for me because I, I had the feeling that, okay, guys, it is not going to work, you know, so they will never communicate with each other. But now after, you know, have we had uh, several runs already, I'm pretty calm because I know this is the only thing which, which I can totally predict will happen every single case that uh, it depends the, the length of the time half for how long they are in this chaotic moment. But, uh, and after that, they come down and they start to find the connections between the objects. That must have been such a challenge um, when coming from uh, the perspective of an art form in theatre where it's very controlled in so many ways. You know exactly where people are sitting, you know exactly what they're going to be looking at, the space they're going to be, you know, how they're going to be interacting with the space. Um, I imagine that stepping back at those moments must have been a real challenge not to want to kind of rush in and go, no, 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 look at this first or whatever. Um, yeah. I can totally see that. I'm really interested to hear from you guys about whether you felt that this particular format worked with the subject matter to have an impact on the audience. And, and from your observation, did you feel like that was the case or um, or would you um, would you do anything differently with the subject matter? Is this do you think this is the right match, if you see what I mean? Uh, it, it's hard to say, obviously, you know, it's um, 
I don't think this this production is perfect or this this project was that was our first try to combine this kind of storytelling elements or 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 interaction with uh, with still telling kind of a story. It is not really a storyline, even if uh, towards the end of the show we have one actor who who comes in in the room those rooms uh, in the last ten minutes of the show. And with the actor together, they try. He's asking uh, them to put together the timeline of what ha what happened, what will happen in the next one hundred years. So, uh, until the time where uh, our character is coming back from the future. So and uh, and basically they can do that. So it's it's quite funny that uh, I was pretty worried that uh, because of the game excitement because this is a very different attitude to play the game and find the riddles and find uh, so this is a different excitement uh, they probably won't really listen to or read or 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 or, or even remember or, or everything what they have found connected with our content with the topic with with uh, with water uh, shortage uh, what um, but most of the times it looks like that uh, they totally kind of get that as well which is uh, which is good <laughs> but uh, obviously in this case i can say that we could you we wouldn't have been able to tell a very complicated and very complex uh, storyline uh, on the other hand if you want to make a production about environment which is not a very typical topic for a theater show <laughs> very few emotional parts <laughs> is that in that <laughs> so i think uh, this pretty good result because basically they got as much as it's possible to kind of uh, get through in a in, in a in a, in a theater uh, production about this mm. well actually in the first trials we had a little problem with that because uh, we have these propaganda movies during uh, the show and exactly when uh, the chaos is happening what we do talked about uh, the monitor lights up and we have these uh, quite long like four minutes I think uh, movies and nobody stopped what they were doing and nobody uh, listened even the people who tried to could not because of the others and so we had to come to a solution to uh, switch off every light and uh, make them stop what they were doing mm. yeah that's true that was that was one of the solutions so every single time they got to which is you know any information comes through video uh and uh, then then we we have to keep them in dark <laughs> that's <laughs> so. really great though because it just proves that play testing these things is so important yeah. and it's it, it's not the same as having a rehearsal where the audience never see the show until the opening night they are so much a part of the experience that you need to be able to make those adaptations to make sure that the experience is, is good. So that's a really great yeah. example, actually, of how something, the best laid plans just sometimes don't fit with the human behavior, which I think is amazing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah in a way, you know, uh, when I told the theater that we only need two weeks of rehearsals, which is very, very little in terms of instead of six or seven weeks of rehearsals, it just did not get it. But I said, but the set should be there on the day one, and then we will only testing the the, the production. And uh, it was really weird because in a, in the classical way of sense of directing a show, I did not have so much thing to do. So I was only checking and checking and checking whether the items are in the right place. I was trying to imagine what if I were one of the guys who doesn't know anything in this room. What would I touch? What wouldn't I touch? So I was trying to play the psychological game which uh, was far away from the experience when we really played with audiences. So yeah. you can't really uh, figure out. <laughs> yeah, and you know, we have these theater minds. It was interesting when we tested with the theater people, they're much more polite because they know the rules of theater. Yes. But the students, they know the rules of escape rooms. You can tear apart everything, you can touch everything, you can unscrew everything. And it was very different yeah. how they reacted. It's interesting to think about young audiences in that way as well and the rules of a space and and how interactivity changes the idea of a theatre building completely actually depending on what story you're telling because we're so used to certain behaviours when we go and go into a theatre space or when we think we're attending what we think is a theatre show. Um, it's kind of great to hear that there are these ways of being an audience that are so drastically different actually. Well, 
thank you so much for talking to us about your project. It was so brilliant to hear about it yesterday. And um, it's really good to get some sort of really deep insights into your process. And um, if anyone wants to check out the project, there's more information on the website. So please take a look at uh, play-on.eu. Brilliant. Thanks so much. Thank you.